Today I'm continuing to teach on how to harness your emotions and we're now into the last teaching in this set. I've got four teachings in my CD and DVD set. We're now into the fourth one entitled Identity in Christ. I've been teaching on self-esteem versus Christ esteem. And I took, I'm not, I didn't count them all, but I would suspect there's 50 or more scriptures that I used just going through scripture showing that pride, arrogance, haughtiness, and all of these kind of things are spoken against. And yet they are actually embraced and promoted. And our concept of self-esteem and always feeling good about ourselves is something that is heavily promoted today and it doesn't square with Scripture. So I've shown the problem here and I've shown that what we should do is exalt God in us and who we are in Him. We need to change identity. Here's another way of saying this, that the Christian life is not a changed life, but an exchanged life. Now that's important. It's not a changed life, but it's an exchanged life. In other words, many people try and just change their actions and change their thoughts and emotions thinking that that's what Christianity is all about. But true Christianity, when you make a commitment to the Lord, boom, you become a brand new creature at that moment on the inside. You exchange your dead, sinful nature for a godly nature that is imparted unto you, imputed unto you by God. And the rest of the Christian life is learning how to unwrap that, how to release it, how to draw it up out of you. And ultimately, yes, it does change your actions and your emotions and your thoughts. But instantly you're changed when you make Jesus your Lord in the Spirit. And the rest of the life isn't trying to get change to come to you. It's releasing what has already been put on the inside of you. Some people may not even see the significance of what I've just said. To you, it may seem like, what's the difference? A huge difference. Huge, huge difference. And so what I want to do, I've talked about that we need to esteem who we are in Christ instead of looking and trying to esteem this old flesh, this physical, natural part of us. So what I want to do now for the rest of this series is just to talk about, all right, who are you in Christ? What do you have? If we're supposed to esteem Christ in us, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, well then what does that mean? What does it look like? What do we have in Christ? Let me start with this verse out of Philemon chapter 1. This is Paul writing to a friend of his, Philemon, and he prays a prayer for him. And I'm just breaking right into the midst of this prayer. But in Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, it says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. This is powerful. The Lord used this verse in my life in a super significant way. It still just really ministers to me. But when I first got really turned on to the Lord, I realized that He was huge. He was bigger than I had ever thought. I encountered God, which I haven't got time to give you that testimony, but I encountered God beyond my understanding. It wasn't in a natural way. It was totally supernatural. God revealed Himself to me, and I instantly knew that God was awesome. I knew that He was much bigger than I had ever thought or experienced. And yet, I didn't know how to get from where I was to where God wanted me to be, to where I could reflect Him and manifest Him. And there was a frustration that just, even though I had been inspired and I had a brand new goal, my whole purpose in living had changed. God had raised my sights, raised my goals tremendously. Even though that was good, at the same time, it was frustrating because where I was was so far from where I knew that I was supposed to be and where God was leading me that I was just frustrated. How do I get from here to there? And I mean, this was a big deal to me. I don't know if I'm communicating it properly, but if you could understand what I'm saying, most people, I think, are right there. You know that God has more than what you're experiencing. You don't doubt that. You don't believe that God's wanting you to live right where you are. You know that you could be living in a greater manifestation of God's blessing and power. But yet, how to get from where you are to where you know you're supposed to be? How do you do this? 
Man, this is a key. God gave this to me and it just set me on fire. He says the communication, the word communication just means that you are transferring something. Right now, I'm communicating with you. I'm taking things that God has put in my heart and I'm transferring them to you. I'm releasing them. I'm sharing them with you. I'm communicating them with you. So this is talking about the communication or you could say the release, the transferal of your faith will become effectual by what? Most people, the way most people live this is, is by, oh, praying and, oh, God, give me more. God, give me more faith. God, touch me. Do this. Give me a blessing. Give me more power. Give me more something. We're always asking God for more. But this says that the communication, the release, transfer of your faith becomes effectual. That means it begins to work by what? Not asking for more, but acknowledging what you have, that good thing, which is in you, in Christ Jesus. It's not by asking for more, pleading with God, praying longer, being holier, or doing something. It's by acknowledging what you already have in Christ Jesus. And when the Lord showed me these verses, it changed my whole focus. Before, I was just begging and pleading with God, Oh God, touch me. Oh God, do something new. Pour out your power. Do this. And I was always begging God to give me something. And instead, the Lord changed my whole focus and my whole direction. And instead of asking God for more, I began to start learning what I already had in Christ Jesus. And I began to discover what God had already done in my life. And I tell you, it has revolutionized me. That was around 1969 or 70 when the Lord gave me this passage of Scripture, changed my focus I began to start getting a revelation of what I call spirit, soul, and body. What happened to me when I got born again. And that has now been, what's that, 45 years? And you know what? I'm still learning. I've never exhausted it. It gave me a direction, a focus for my life that I, 45 years later, I'm still seeking the Lord. I'm still learning. I've learned a lot, but I've still got a lot to learn. What I don't know would fill volumes. What I do know will fill 50 books that I've written and materials, but what I don't know would fill volumes. And I'm still learning. And this changed my life. And brothers and sisters, this is what every one of us need. Instead of looking at what we don't have, we need to look at what we do have in Christ. And so what I want to do throughout the rest of this series is to sit here and just begin to start sharing with you some of the things that I discovered about who I am in Christ, what God has done on the inside of me. And if you are like I was, which I believe that the vast majority of Christians do not have a clear understanding of what God has done on the inside of them. This says that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing in you in Christ Jesus. If I, if I was talking to you person to person, if you were sitting on the other side of this table from me, and I said, all right, write down all of the good things that are in you. And if I was to just ask you to do that, I think it would be really revealing what you wrote down. There are some of you that wouldn't be able to write down anything. You'd think, well, there isn't any good thing in me. You're so upset with yourself and all of this that you may not have anything. Others might write down that, oh, you're a very outgoing person. You're a caring person and you might write down some things. But you know what? Truthfully, most people, if you were sitting here at this table and responding personally to me, you would write down characteristics about your physical body or your soulish, mental, emotional part. Very few people without me giving you direction and kind of priming you and showing you what I'm talking about would sit down and write about who they are in Christ. They wouldn't write down what Jesus has done for them. They would write down things that they have been doing for Jesus and write those down as those good things. That's not what this is talking about. First of all, let me address this. For those of you who say, well, there is no good thing in me. Let me turn over and read this out of Romans chapter 7. This is the Apostle Paul talking. And some of you may have thought of this verse. But in verse... Um, what verse is this? It says, in me... It's in verse 18. For I know that in me... Parentheses, that is, in my flesh... 
parentheses, dwelleth no good thing. And some of you may have thought of this verse when I said you're supposed to acknowledge those good things that are in you. Somebody says, well, there isn't any good thing in me. There's a couple of ways that you could arrive at that conclusion. First of all, you just have done something really bad. You've messed up. You've, you've ruined your marriage. You've ruined your job. You've, I don't know, maybe you've got a terminal disease and you're needing care and you aren't contributing. You just have to be waited on and taken care of. And because of that, you're bummed out. You may have lost your job or whatever. And so you arrive at this conclusion that in you, there's no good thing because you failed in some area. Well, see, again, you are missing the truth that that physical existence that you live is not the real you. The real you is a spirit being on the inside. And I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to show you what God has put on the inside of you. And regardless of what you're going through in your natural physical existence, if you've made Jesus your Lord, you are absolutely awesome on the inside. And I know some of you don't feel that way. Well, no, in me, there's no good thing. That's not true. And then there's some people that arrive at that conclusion because they're religious and they've been taught from religion against thinking anything good about themselves. That's the way that I was. You know, I used all of these scriptures that I went through and it talks about pride and exalting yourself and you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross. You've got to hate your own life in comparison to your devotion to God. And all of these type of scriptures... Religion is used those to beat people down and think that you can't think anything good about you. There's no good thing in you. And some people say, well, isn't that what Paul said? No. Look at this again in verse 18. I know that in me, and then he puts a parenthesis, that is, in my flesh dwells no good thing. If he would have just said that in me dwells no good thing, that would not have been true. Because when you get born again, God is in you. And I guarantee you, God's awesome. Your born-again spirit is awesome. It would have been incorrect for Paul to say that in me there dwells no good thing. It's incorrect for you to say that in you dwells no good thing. That's not true. If you've been born again, you've got God Almighty living on the inside of you. And you've got a born-again, recreated spirit that is equal in power and in authority and in knowledge and in all of the fruit of the Spirit, etc., to Jesus. It's been recreated. It is His Spirit sent into your heart. And I guarantee you, on the inside of you is something that is absolutely awesome. So what was Paul saying? He said that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. The word flesh isn't talking about just your skin, your epidermis, but the scriptural term flesh is referring to your physical body, and your mental, emotional part, what the Bible calls the soul, your body and soul realm, in that alone, there dwells no good thing. Now again, this is offensive to a lot of people that are really into self-esteem because they take pride on how beautiful they are. You know, not all of us are beautiful people. Uh, I've, you know, never been considered a beautiful person. I'm not maybe the ugliest, but, you know, I've just been average in everything I ever do. And I've never considered myself to be special in the physical, natural realm. Some people do. Some people are just these, you know, picture perfect people. Everything's perfect. Some of you, your mental ability is just awesome. You, everything you do is with excellence. But did you know in that part of you, there is no good thing. And some of you take offense at that because you really pride yourself. You esteem and glorify your looks, your accomplishments. You've got doctor's degrees. You've got all of these things. But if you were to compare this with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 was the most learned, educated man of the day. He was awesome. He had the equivalent of multiple doctor's degrees. And yet over in Philippians chapter 3, let me just turn over and read some of this. He, he said that he wouldn't have ever spoken this way on his own. He wouldn't have exalted himself. But since people were criticizing him, he says, I'll show you what I've accomplished in the flesh. And he listed all of his accomplishments. And he basically was a greater Pharisee. He was better at everything than any of them were. But then he said this in verse 7, Philippians 3, 7, "...but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ." Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of God, 
or excuse me, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Again, Paul was probably one of the most educated men of his day. And he said, all of these doctors degree, all of my recognition, all of my accomplishments are like dung. You know, that's an old English polite way of referring to some things that I won't use the terminology today, but you can fill in the blank. I mean, this was an offensive term. You know, today we take our dung and frame it and put it on a wall so that everybody can see that you've got this doctor's degree. You know, I'm not saying that you can't do that. If you are practicing medicine, you need to have a doctor's degree to prove that you've been through the school and you know what you're doing. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm saying that Paul would have taken that and said, that's like dung. That's just like taking a cow patty and framing it and putting it on your wall. That's the way that Paul looked at it. And I know that this is offensive to a lot of people because you take much, much pride in your physical looks and appearance, your physical strength, your accomplishments, the trophies that you've won. You take much uh, satisfaction in all of your mental accomplishments and all of these kind of things. But you know, the scripture says, let him, don't let the rich man glory in his riches. Don't let the mighty man glory in his might. Don't let anybody glory in anything except this, that they understand and know me. That's all that we are supposed to glory in. And if you are glorying in yourself and in your accomplishments and all of the things that you've done and you expect people to somehow or another treat you special because you've done this, because you've got this degree, then you know what? You are not like the Apostle Paul. Paul said, it's just all dung. I count it, but dung, so that I may know Christ. And this is what he's referring to when he said over here in Romans chapter 7, for I know that in me, that's just in my physical body, in my physical accomplishments, my mental ability, my understanding, my personality, all of these kind of things, in just the physical and the soulish realm, there dwells no good thing. But Paul is also the one that said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, that he was seeking to make known among the Gentiles the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Paul knew that in himself, all of his accomplishments, mental and emotional, were like dung compared to what he had in Christ. Paul wasn't living from the physical realm. He was living out of the spirit man. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The secret to Paul's life was that he was dead to himself. He was dead to this flesh. He didn't exalt and esteem the flesh. It was not self-esteem, but he was esteeming Christ in him. He was living through Christ. He was letting Christ live through him. He was drawing on Christ's ability. You know, I'm going to be sharing these things in more detail as we go through this, but it was a major change in my life when I quit trying to have faith in God and believe God for things. And when I realized that God lived in me and he had already given me faith, And I just needed to learn and respond, cooperate with the faith that he gave me. It's not my faith in him. It's his faith in me. Matter of fact, Paul said that in that verse that I've already quoted. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He didn't say I'm living by faith in the Son of God. He said, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. Huge difference. Huge difference. See, when you talk about I've got faith in God, well, your faith may be strong or weak or whatever. But if it's God's faith, if it's the faith of the Son of God, you know that Jesus is perfect. And you know that Jesus' faith is complete and it's sufficient. And if you start using His faith, then you should expect to see supernatural results. There's a difference between a human faith in God and God's faith living in you. See, this is what I said earlier about it's not a changed life, it's an exchanged life. And this is what the very first verse I used, Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, where it says the communication, the release of your faith becomes effectual how? 
by acknowledging these good things in you. I've already got the faith of Jesus on the inside of me. This changed my life when I saw that. You know, the very first teaching I ever put out on tape, on a reel-to-reel -reel tape, was entitled, The Faith of God. And it was based on what I'm talking about right here, that I have the faith of the Son of God, not just faith in the Son of God, but God gave me His faith. And when I realized that and quit trying to believe in Him, but I started believing what He had already done and started using His faith, and acting like he told me to act, it changed the results. I started seeing blind eyes open, people raised from the dead, miracles happen. There's a difference when you live from who you are in Christ. And this is the part that we're supposed to esteem. Did you know I do not esteem myself? I, I don't hate myself. But I'm, a, I'm aware that, you know, I am not a silver vessel. I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. God could have called somebody who was much better equipped to do what I'm doing. I am not the perfect person. The thing that I've got going for me is that I know I'm not perfect. I've humbled myself. I depend upon God, probably more so than a lot of people who have great talents and abilities, and they could do it on their own. I can't do anything on my own. And this is the only reason that God is using me is because I've humbled myself and I'm dependent upon Him and God flows through me. I'm living out of His ability. And this is what I'm trying to share with you that instead of you trying to live for God, you need to get out of the way and let God live through you. And before you can do that, you've got to find out what He's done. You've got to find out what power He's placed on the inside of you. You need to find out who you are in Christ. You need a new identity. And then you need to start living and esteeming who you are in Christ and what He's done for you and who you are in Him and what you can do through Christ, not what you can do for Christ in your physical, natural self. See, to me, self-esteem is all about self. I don't believe we're supposed to have self-esteem. We're supposed to esteem Christ and what He has done in us but not our physical self. And this is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, when he says, In me, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. If you could somehow or another take the Spirit away from Paul, just talking about himself, there was no good thing. And this was a man who was learned, who was educated, who could probably out-argue, out-talk anybody. He had given his life for the purpose of the Lord. He had laid his life down. He had been beaten. He had been in prison. He had done all of these things that most people would glory in. But Paul said that in my flesh, there is no good thing. The only thing that Paul glorified and esteemed was Christ in him. And it just so happened that this man wrote half of the New Testament books. And it's because of that attitude. He didn't esteem himself. He didn't promote himself. He was willing to lay his life down for the Lord. You know, this is significant. One of the things that I teach in this album on how to be happy, I take the book of Philippians and we go through the book of Philippians. Paul wrote that while he was in prison. And Paul had been imprisoned unjustly. He had been beaten. At the time that he wrote it, he had been in prison for years. And I mean, prison in his day was not like prison in our day where you have a flat screen TV and all of these amenities and stuff. I mean, it was prison. It was hard. And he had been in there for years. And the Philippians heard about this and they wrote to ask how he was. And when he went to comfort them, you know how he did it? He says, don't worry about me because the things that have happened have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Christ is being preached. Everybody in Caesar's household is hearing about the gospel. And because of this, people are being born again and therefore everything's awesome. Did you know most people wouldn't have taken that approach? If somebody said, how are you? They would have just talked about themselves. Oh, I'm suffering. It's cold in here. They don't, the food's not good. I've been in prison for years unjustly. I've been through a shipwreck. They beat me. I'm facing possible ex ex execution. They would talk about all of these things concerning themselves. But see the apostle Paul, because he had died to himself and he wasn't esteeming himself and promoting himself. He loved God more than he loved himself. He loved sharing the gospel with other people more than he loved what happened to him. 
And because of that, if the gospel was flourishing, if the gospel was being preached and proclaimed through his imprisonment, then his imprisonment was just fine. Boy, that's, that's an awesome attitude. And in that letter from jail to the Philippians, he, he used the word joy, rejoice, rejoicing, rejoiceth 17 times in four little chapters. He talked more about joy and happiness in that brief epistle than he did in any other thing. And yet his circumstances were probably worse than they had ever been. And yet he was happier and more joyful you know why? Because it wasn't all about him. It was all about God. And God was being glorified. God was being promoted. And because of it, he was just fine. Now that is the secret to happiness. That's the key to how you do it. It's just like what Jesus said. When you lose your life, then is when you find it. When you find something that is bigger than yourself to live for, Man, that's when you begin to start really living. If you are all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. If it's all about you, selfish, selfishness and promotion of self is like a drug addiction. You can never satisfy it. You may temporarily get numb, but then when you sober up, you'll have to have another fix and it'll have to be a bigger fix because your body adjusts to it. You never can satisfy self and lust for self and all the things that self wants. The only way to deal with yourself is to deny it and get to where you love God and other people more than you love yourself. Boy, those are some big, big statements right there. But that is really powerful. And so I was sharing that it's when I begin to acknowledge every good thing that was in me in Christ Jesus, Philemon 1, 6. That's when my life began to take on meaning and things begin to change is when I quit trying to approach life and all of its hardships and everything in my own self, in my own wisdom, my own strength, my own ability. And instead I started change. I changed my identity to who I was in Christ. And I started dealing with things from him living in me. Like Paul said, I quoted this on my program yesterday in Galatians 2.20, that he was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he lived, yet it wasn't him. It was Christ living in him. That's the key to the Christian life. The Christian life is not just difficult or hard to live. It's impossible to live. It is impossible for you to model what Jesus told us to do in your own ability. It is beyond you. It is superhuman. The only way you can ever live up to what the Bible says is for you to get out of the way and let Christ live through you to find out who you are, what you've done, what God has given you in the Spirit. And when you acknowledge these good things that are in you in Christ, that's when you begin to start seeing the life of Christ flow through you. Well, that's a mouthful. I said some really, really important things. Here's some of the ways that I begin to understand this. And this is just going to be scratching the surface. There is no way that I can go into the detail. Matter of fact, I've got an entire teaching in book form, CDs, DVDs, entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. And it goes into this in much more detail. But here is a quick Cliff Notes edition of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This verse revolutionized my life. Let me just go back and give you a little bit of the background. I got born again when I was eight and I've lived for God the best I knew how ever since then. I've certainly messed it up and made lots of mistakes, but I'm saying that was my desire. And from eight until I was 18, I did everything that I was being told and everything that I thought would obtain me the desired results relationship with God. But I became a legalist. I became a Pharisee, trusting in my goodness because that's basically what was taught me. And when I was 18, I had an encounter where God Almighty showed up and He released His glory and His power to me. I saw it. I experienced it. And relative to God, I was the most vile thing that could possibly be. And compared to people, I might have been better than most people. But compared to God, I realized I was nothing. 
and I honestly thought God was going to kill me and I started confessing everything I could think of so that if He did kill me, I'd hopefully go to heaven instead of hell. And to my surprise, when I got through for an hour and a half just turning myself inside out and mentioning everything I vow that I'd ever done or thought, hoping that that would be sufficient, to my surprise, instead of God's punishment, I had a supernatural, tangible love from God flow over me for four and a half months. It just revolutionized my life. And so I, I was thrilled that He didn't kill me. I was thrilled that He loved me. And I knew that He loved me. And I also knew that it had nothing to do with my goodness because when I finally got that revelation was when I finally admitted that there wasn't any good thing in my flesh, just like Paul said in Romans 7, 18. And so I knew it wasn't based on any goodness that I'd done. And I, I enjoyed it for those four and a half months. But when the four and a half months left and I came back down off of that emotional high, I didn't know how to adjust. I didn't know how to go back to being normal. I'd tasted of something that, man, was so awesome, I didn't want to go back to being normal, but I didn't know how to get back into this revelation of the love of God. And one of the best things that ever happened to me was right then I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, it was kind of a strange situation, but I was a chaplain's assistant without a chaplain. And so I basically, the, the chaplain was assigned back to the brigade which is a larger unit. But I was out on the battalion level and the chaplain was gone. I didn't have a chaplain. So technically, my commanders, the people I was responsible to, were back at the brigade level, but I was on the battalion level and nobody had any control over me. It's just like I sat there for 13 months with basically no supervision. And because of that, I just opened up the Bible and started reading. And through... Uh, 15 hours, anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a day, I would sit and just read the Bible and God began to reveal to me who I was in Christ. He began to show me what He had put on the inside of me, not through some outward physical emotion, but just through a revelation of who I was in the Spirit. And this verse was critical to that process because, see, I had tasted what God was like. And I could see in Scripture what it was like to live a supernatural life where you see the dead raised and blind eyes open and you're able to turn the other cheek and, and you have boldness when your natural tendency is weakness. And I saw these things, but I wasn't experiencing them in my life. And because I couldn't see it in my physical realm, it made me think I didn't have it. And I spent most of my time in Vietnam begging God to touch me again and waiting on God to do something from the outside to touch me. And while I was waiting, I just started reading the Bible. And this verse rocked my world because it says, if you are in Christ, that's talking about if you were born again, which I knew I was born again. I'd made a commitment to the Lord. It says you are a new creature. It didn't say you are going to be a new creature. You are in the process of becoming a new creature. No, it puts it as it's already been done. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It didn't say old things are going to pass away. In the next 20 years, you will see a change. It didn't say that this is a process. It just said it's a done deal. And I looked at my life, and even though I wasn't living outwardly in sin or, you know, experiencing any of those things, I wasn't seeing the victory that was promised me in the Bible to where every time you pray, God answers your prayer where you see power flow and things. I wasn't seeing that in my life. And it, it was a conflict. And when I read this verse, God just revealed to me that old things are passed away. All things are become new. And I couldn't see it. And I was saying, God, I believe your word, but I can't see this in my life. How can it be true? And just like that, God began to reveal to me that there is a spirit inside of people. There's more than just my physical body, which is obvious, and then my mental, emotional part on the inside, what we call our personality, our inner person. But the Lord showed me through scripture that we have a spirit on the inside. 
And the Spirit is actually the real you. It says in James chapter 2, verse 26, As the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. What that's saying is it's your spirit that gives life to your body. And if you extract the spirit, your body is dead. People think that our life comes through this heart and through these organs and stuff. Those are essential to you breathing and living here, but it's your spirit, man, that really gives you all of this. When God created Adam and Eve, it says that his entire body was formed. He had a heart, he had lungs, he had a brain, he had everything was present. But there wasn't life until God breathed into him the breath of life. And the word breathe there in the Hebrew is the exact word that we use for spirit. God literally blew his spirit into our physical bodies. And the spirit is the life-giving part of us. We, we often miss this because we become so carnal, so dominated by our physical realm. And we think it's this physical flesh and our heart beating, and our lungs, and our DNA, those things are things that the Spirit of God uses, but it's the Spirit that gives life. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 6, verse 63. It says, the, it's the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus said that it's the spirit man that's the real you. You are technically a spirit being that has a soul which involves your emotion and mental part and you live in a body, but the real you is spirit. So the reason I bring all this up is to say that I was saying, God, you said I, I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I can't see that. But it was because I was only looking in the physical realm. I still had the same body. I still had the same thoughts, some of the same fears, some of the same phobias. And I was only searching the mental and emotional and physical part of me. But it was a revelation when I realized that the real me is a spirit being. Let me take this passage of scripture over in 1 Thessalonians and in chapter 5, Paul uh, said in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse makes it very clear. There's other verses that say the same thing, but this one puts it all in one verse, that you have a spirit, soul, and body. Functionally, most people only recognize the body and the soul part. Again, you can't deny that you've got a body. You can feel whether you're hot or cold, whether you're tired or rested, whether you have pain or whether you have joy. You can feel things in the physical realm. And then there's this soulish or mental part where you think things. Like, for instance, I could come up and touch your physical body, tap you on the shoulder, and even though you were looking the other direction and doing something else, you would automatically know something because I touched your physical body. You're in touch with that. You know what you feel. But, you know, I could also touch you without ever touching your body by saying words. I constantly make some people happy and blessed and glad and other people I make mad. And yet I've never touched you and yet I have touched you by my words. You can say things that will hurt a person or you can say things that will make a person laugh or you can say things that will make a person uh, have tears of joy. There is a mental, emotional part. And see, we're in touch with those two parts. If I touch you on your shoulder, you feel it. If I touch you with words, you can feel it. But according to this verse, there is a third part that's called the, called the spirit. And did you know that you cannot feel your spirit? And I know some of you think, well, that doesn't make sense because we're so used to doing things only in the physical, natural realm. And we think that if there, if there was another part on the inside of me, I'd know it. For instance, if you're hot or cold right now, you know it. If I was to walk up and say, you know, if you were in a service and I said, are you hot or cold? Do we need to turn the air conditioning up or down? You wouldn't have to come back to me and say, well, let me pray about it. And I, tomorrow I'll come back and tell you how I am. You just instantly know if you're hot or cold. If I was to ask you, are you happy or sad? You don't have to say, well, let me pray about it and I'll come back tomorrow and I'll tell you. No, you're instantly in touch with your emotions but you have a spirit man that you are not in touch with. And this is what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 6, verse 63, when he says, it's the spirit that quickens. 
The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. The only way you can contact your spirit man is through the word that God has given us, not through your physical feelings. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3 when he was talking to Nicodemus. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was shocked like, born again? Are you saying that I have to crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? He wasn't talking about a physical birth. He was talking about a spiritual birth. In the same way that you receive a physical body, you have to receive a new born again spirit, a spirit that is from above. And Nicodemus just couldn't understand it. And Jesus said unto him in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Water is talking about the natural birth that you were born with. And then born of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then he said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He was talking about that just like you get born in the natural realm and you have a physical body, you have to have a spiritual birth where you get a spirit, a brand new spirit. This is where we get the term born again from. A spirit that is born from above. A spiritual birth. And another way of saying this is that your physical is physical, but your spirit is spiritual. There isn't any direct relationship between the two. You can't feel spiritual things with your physical body. Your physical body can only discern physical things, but your spirit, man, can only be discerned by the Word of God. And so, the reason I bring all this out is that some people think, well, now wait, if I had a brand new spirit and if I was all of these things, I'd know it. No, because you can only know the spirit by the words that Jesus spoke unto us. They are spirit and they are life. Another verse that goes along with this is in James chapter 1. It says, whoever looks into this perfect law of liberty, talking about the new covenant, is like a man that beholds his face in a glass. Or it's talking about a mirror. You can't see your face. You know, some of you have never thought of this, but you have never seen your face. And some of you think, oh, yes, I have. I've seen my face. No, you've seen a reflection of your face. You've seen a picture of your face, a drawing of your face. But you've never seen your face with your eyes. You trust what you see in a mirror. How do you know that the image you see in a mirror is correct? Haven't you ever seen one of these mirrors that makes you tall and skinny or short and fat? And it can distort things. How do you know that the image you're seeing isn't distorted? I'm not trying to get you to doubt what you see in the mirror, but I'm saying that, see, you don't really see yourself. You are seeing a representation, a reflection of yourself, and you've learned to trust it. The Bible says that it is a spiritual mirror. If you want to see who you are in the spirit, you can't just go by how you feel because your feelings can only discern things in the physical and the emotional realm. The only way I can really see who I am in Christ is to hold up the mirror of God's word and read what it says about my spirit man. I can't tell if my hair's combed by just feeling how it is. I have to go look in a mirror and I just trust that image that I see in the mirror. Likewise, I can't tell who I really am in the spirit man by just my feelings. What I have to do is go by what God's word says. And I have gotten to where I trust God's word more than I trust a physical mirror. I, I trust this absolutely. When it says that I can go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, that's who I am in the spirit. That's the power and the authority that I have. Now, I can't feel it in just my physical, emotional realm, but I believe it. And this revolutionized my life. It changed my attention. It, well, here's another way of saying it. It changed my identity from just this physical, natural person to who I was in Christ. Did you know in the natural realm, I was an introvert when I was in high school. I couldn't even look at a person and talk to them. I was introverted. I was insecure. I was shy. I was all of these things. And uh, I mean, it was painful. You know, I played baseball. I played Little League the way a lot of people did in the United States when I was a kid. And when I was with my friends, people that I knew and that I was comfortable with, did you know I could always throw a ball further than anybody else I knew? 
And I could do a lot of good things. And when we were playing with just my friends, man, I, I was captain. I would choose teams and I could do all of these things. But when I got in Little League and I was around people I didn't know and especially grandstands, man, I just couldn't handle people in the grandstands. Did you know I played, I forget how many years, I played six or seven years of Little League. I never one time got a hit. And yet, when we were playing with just my friends, I, I could hit as well, run as well, throw as well, do anything as well as anybody else. But I was so painfully shy, I would just stand there and they'd throw the ball and I'd strike out nearly every time. And I tried with everything I could to overcome it, but I was just paralyzed by my insecurity. I remember one time I finally hit the ball and I mean, it was a home run. It was over the fence and the guy jumped up and caught it. My only hit in my whole career was caught and I was out. And you know what? It was just my fear. It was my insecurities. This is the way, see, that I knew myself and I lived with these limitations and fear of what people were going to think about me and all of this kind of stuff. But when I saw this truth, I began to realize that there was another me that I hadn't known before. And I switched identities. And I started finding out who I was in Christ. What did Jesus do for me? Who did He make me? What power and authority did He give me? And I mean, it was liberating. It was liberating. You know, if I didn't understand the spirit realm, and if all I was doing was just trying to improve this flesh, there are coping techniques, and this is primarily what psychology does. It just teaches you how to cope and improve your carnal, physical, natural self. And to a degree, they can help you. You may get to where you can function and do things, but man, there is a huge difference between me just learning to cope and manage and get a little better. I have changed identities. I am a new person in Christ. You know, people that work for me right now, people who are around me, as I tell these stories about how when I was in Little League, I just stood there and struck out every time, couldn't even swing the bat. People look at me and think, that, I, that doesn't even sound like you, because now I am an opposite type of person. I'm still not the best baseball player, but I can do anything, and I will work at it, and, and I don't let my emotions and what other people are thinking about me stop me and hinder me. I have been transformed, and it wasn't through coping mechanisms and learning how to deal. I became a new person in Christ. And I'm sharing with you that rather than you just trying to exalt yourself and improve yourself, instead of trying to change your life, you need to exchange it. You need to make Jesus your Lord. If you've already done that, then you need to get a revelation of what Jesus did for you when you got saved. And I guarantee you, you are a totally, totally, totally brand new person on the inside. You have special gifts and anointings from God that will empower you to do things that are completely beyond your ability. Here I am speaking. We've got 3.2 billion people on this planet that can watch this program on a daily basis. Of course, not all of those tune in, but if you just took 1%, that would be 32 million people watching this program right now. And I used to be so embarrassed and so shy that I couldn't stand in front of 15 or 20 people in the grandstands. I'd just freeze in panic. I guarantee you that I haven't just improved and changed a little bit. I've exchanged. I found out I'm a new person. When I found out that God loved me and I experienced that love, it's just gotten to a place that I really don't care that much about what other people think about me. I do to a degree, but I'm, I'm saying I'm not paralyzed by it. And it's set me free. It's changed my life. There are many of you that this is a key. If you could just begin to start esteeming what Christ has done. You became a new person. And in the Spirit, you are a totally, totally, totally different person than what you think you are. And I know some of you are thinking, well, how could I be different than what I think I am? Because there is more than just this mental, emotional, and physical part of you. 
Just look at it this way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You can tell that this is not talking about your body. Because if you were a man before you got saved, you're still going to be a man after you get saved. If you were fat before you got saved, you're still going to be fat after you get saved, unless you go on a diet. But you don't instantly change. This isn't talking about your physical body. Your physical body didn't change. It's also not talking about your soulish realm, your mental and emotional part, because when you got born again, you still have your thoughts, not my thoughts. You have your memories. You remember where you grew up. You remember your parents. You remember your siblings. You remember your school and the things that happened to you. You still have the same mind. Your mind and emotions didn't change when you got born again. So what's it talking about? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, by process of elimination, you can tell it's not talking about your physical body. It's not talking about your mind and emotional realm. The only thing that's left based on that verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, where you have a spirit, soul, and body. If your soul and body didn't change, then that means it has to be talking about your spirit. Before you got born again, you had a spirit that was dead, separated from God. It doesn't mean that it was non-functional, that it didn't exist. The word death in the Bible means separation. When a person dies, their spirit doesn't die. It doesn't cease to exist. It separates from your body and it goes to be with the Lord. So the biblical meaning of death is separation. It doesn't mean ceasing to exist, the end. And when it says that you were dead in trespasses and sins... That doesn't mean that you weren't existing or that your spirit was non-functional. It was very functional. Matter of fact, it says over in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were by nature, that's talking about that spirit within you, a child of the devil. You actually were born with a spirit that was separated from God and it just had evil in it. All of us were born in sin is what David said in Psalms chapter 51. In sin did my mother conceive me. That wasn't talking about an adulterous relationship. It just means that our parents were all sinners and they conceived and bore children who were all sinners. We were born with the sin nature in us. Romans chapter 5 says that about six or seven times in the latter verses of Romans chapter 5, that we became sinners by one man's disobedience, not by your acts your actions of sin were the result of your sinful nature. They did not produce a sinful nature. You were born with a sinful nature that caused you to live in sin. So I'm saying all of this to say that prior to you making Jesus your Lord, you had a spirit within you that the Bible says was dead, not ceasing to exist or non-functional, but it was separated from God and it was actually united to the devil and it actually forced you, compelled you towards sin. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to be mean. You don't have to teach a child to go hit your sibling and take that toy away. It's in their nature. We were born with a sinful nature. But when you got born again, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and many other scriptures, you became a new person. Not in your physical body, not in your soul, mental, or mental realm, but in your spirit. You became a brand new person. Matter of fact, one of the translations that I've read this in says you became a brand new species of being that never existed before. Prior to Jesus coming and putting in the new covenant, Old Testament saints weren't born again. They didn't get a brand new spirit. They were people that had a relationship with God by faith, but they hadn't received a changed nature yet. And they were constantly in the um, stage of trying to bridle that old nature to hold themselves back, to deny themselves and discipline themselves. The New Testament Christian is different. We now have a brand new nature that is united to God. It is holy. It is pure. And the Christian life isn't more of, of suppressing your nature. It's releasing this new nature, renewing your mind. Boy, that's a big difference right there. I'm not sure everybody got that, but that is a huge, huge difference. And you became a brand new person on the inside. And the victory in the Christian life is to find out who you are 
and what Jesus did for you and change your identity. You know, I knew a man one time that was raised in a very bad situation. His parents were alcoholics. They stayed drunk all of the time and they just let him roam on his own. And this kid was a doper and an alcoholic. I, I'm not sure the exact age, but when very young, I don't know, eight or nine or something like this, he was already strung out. He wouldn't go to school. His parents were poor. They spent all their money on booze. And as a result, he would just run around in his underwear. All he had was just dirty underwear. Well, the, um, the truant officers would come every once in a while and find him, and they'd put clothes on him and send him to school. And he'd go for a while until his clothes got dirty and his parents weren't taking care of him, and he'd wind up going back home. And he just lived this life, and he was strung out. I think he said from the time he was 13 on up to 18 or 19, he doesn't remember anything. He was just strung out on drugs or alcohol all of the time. And anyway, he did so much damage to himself. He was in a mental hospital. He was in a mental ward. He was doing some type of work to keep him busy, like, uh, I don't know, a little tapestry or doing some kind of just, you know, busy work. And anyway, a person came in, witnessed to him. He accepted Jesus and got born again. And I mean instantly he, he changed, and he was experiencing God. He's now the pastor of a very large church. And I mean, it changed his life. But here's my point in bringing all of this up. Because he was either drunk or high on drugs or something for so many years, he just didn't have much of a past. He couldn't remember his past. He didn't have an identity. His only identity was to be a doper or a drug addict, but he stayed high most of the time. So honestly, he hadn't formed a personality as such. He didn't have an identity. And when he got born again, and he now quit all of his drugs, and he quit the alcohol, and he quit this, he didn't know who he was. And he asked the person that led him to the Lord. And he says, so how do I act? What do I do? And the person that led him to the Lord didn't know exactly what to say. And he said, just take the Bible and read about Jesus. Jesus is the way we're all supposed to be. And just be like Jesus. Just make that who you are because you now have Jesus living on the inside of you. And so he told him to just imitate Jesus. And anyway, this man, when I first met him, he was so kind. He was so sweet. He gave me so much. He just lavished me with things. But you know what? When, I, when he first did that, I put my hand on my wallet and I told my wife, I said, you watch this guy. Nobody's this nice. He's after something. He's buttering me up. He's setting me up for a fall. I said, he's trying to get to me. And I honestly didn't trust him. But after, I don't even know, he gave me hundreds of thousands of dollars. Over a period of time, he bought me five cars and paid for them. He made the payments on them for, I don't know, 12 years or more, something like that. And he gave me cars and he gave money to the ministry and he did things. And after a certain period of time, it finally dawned on me that this man's never going to get out of me what he put into me. And he must not be doing this for an ulterior motive. And I finally dropped my guard and began to start having a relationship with him. And, and the reason at first he put me off is because he was too sweet. And you know why? Because he just decided he was going to be like Jesus. And he didn't have his old carnal self that acted like an anchor or a weight to hold him back. He didn't have a personality. He didn't know who he was. And so he just started trying to imitate Jesus. Would to God that every one of us could get our minds erased so that we didn't have all of this baggage and we didn't come from a family to where we're just mean and angry and bitter and this is our personality trait. Would to God that all of us could just get our mind erased and we could just start over afresh and go to start acting like Jesus. Because that's who you really are in the Spirit. But see, the problem is that we haven't renewed our mind. We still have this old concept of who we are, what we can do, what our limitations are, and we don't see ourselves in Christ. We are having self-esteem. We are trying to modify and improve and have behavior modification on this old flesh. That's not how Paul did it. Paul said, I am dead. I died with Christ and yet I'm alive. But it's not me, it's Christ in me. He had learned how to deny himself. 
Paul had actually murdered people in the name of the Lord. He had persecuted them. He had spoken against them. He helped in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. He actually held the coats of people who stoned the first martyr, Stephen, to death. And he participated in that death. And he had all of these things. And when he turned to the Lord, now he had a lot of shame, guilt, and confusion. But instead of just limping through life, thinking, but look who I am. And my, maybe I've improved a little bit now. I'm not persecuting the Christians anymore, but how could I ever wipe this out? And instead of living his life, struggling with all of these things, he became a new person in Christ. He's the one that wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that if you are in Christ, you are a new person. You are no longer an alcoholic. You're no longer a drug dealer. You're no longer a homosexual. You're no longer a failure. I don't care if you've had five marriages fail. You are no longer that. You are a brand new person in Christ. You are clean. You are pure. Everything that God is, you are in your spirit because it's His spirit that He placed on the inside of you. It says in Galatians chapter 4 that He sent forth the spirit of His Son into you, crying, Abba, Father, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you're sitting there saying, how could this be? How could I have God living in me? I, I just can't believe that. Well, then you aren't any of his if you don't have the Spirit of Christ. The Bible teaches that when you get born again, God sends forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. The word Abba is a infant, uh, an affectionate term between a child and a parent. Like instead of saying, Father... It's daddy. That's what it's meaning. It's an intimate term. And when you say he sent forth the spirit into your heart crying, Abba, Father, this gives you direct access to God as your heavenly daddy. Man, this is awesome. This is who you are. You're a brand new person if you have made Jesus your Lord. And even though you've been stained by failure and problems, you aren't that person anymore. I tell you, this liberated me because like I was sharing, I was a failure in so many areas before, but when I found out who I was in Christ, it's just like somebody flipped a switch on the inside of me. It was like I, instead of me just trying to take this messed up life that I had wound up with, and it wasn't messed up in the sense that I was out doing terrible, terrible things, but religion had messed me up. I was introverted. I was fearful. I was insecure and all of these things. And instead of me trying to take that messed up life and trying to improve it, I just found out through the Word of God what God had done for me, who I was, and I began to start rejoicing and celebrating. And it's like I just changed my identity. I began to be that brand new person that God wanted me to be. And I tell you, when I did that, it transformed everything. And it's still being transformed. You know, today, our ministry, I'm doing things that are just completely opposite of what I could have done before. And even though I haven't done everything the way that God wants me to, I haven't reached all of the goals. I've come a long ways. I haven't arrived, but I've left. And I'm telling you, I'm seeing God touch me individually. I'm seeing God flow through me and touch other people and make an impact in people's lives that I couldn't have done on my own. I am not doing this in myself. I am not esteeming and promoting myself. I am not doing these things by myself, but it is Christ in me and what he's made me that I'm learning how to rely on him. And because of it, I see the power of God flow through me on a regular basis. You need to find out who you are in Christ. You need a new identity. And then you need to start living and esteeming who you are in Christ and what he's done for you and who you are in him and what you can do through Christ not what you can do for Christ in your physical, natural self. See, to me, self-esteem is all about self.